Amen. Well, it's good to be with you all here this morning. Today, we're going to be hearing a message called Extraordinary Ordinary. Um, <laughs> and the passage that we'll be looking at, if you want to open up your Bibles or Bible apps, is Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. And Matthew 14, verses 13 to 21 reads, When Jesus heard what had happened, this refers to he had just heard that his cousin John the Baptist um, had been executed. And um, so that's what this refers to. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowd followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Amen, amen. This, this account in Matthew is often, you know, we talk about it in the church frequently as, you know, Jesus feeding the 5,000. If you've been around in church community for some time, this is likely a passage that, that is familiar to you. And very frequently when, when we talk about this passage, we explore, um, there's, there's many facets of, of this passage to explore, and often we emphasize, you know, Jesus' miraculous power to multiply these loaves and these fish. We talk about his compassion. He, he was going away to a solitary place, likely to grieve the loss of John the Baptist, and yet he met these people with needs, these ones who came to him, and he had compassion, and, and he healed them, and he spent time with them. We often talk about Jesus's invitation to participate in what he's doing. He didn't just, you know, multiply and, and feed them out of his own hands or make bread rain from the sky, which we know that he could have. Um, but he invited his disciples to participate in this miracle with him by passing out the bread and the loaves, by taking what they had and miraculously multiplying that. We often talk about, um, as well, the disciples' lack of belief that when Jesus said, feed them, they were like, well, we only have, you know, five loaves of bread. How are we meant to feed thousands? Sometimes we even talk about the claims that Jesus is making about who he is through this scripture based on retelling of some things in the Old Testament. And, and these are all um, good and, and, and wonderful and, and true things to explore and learn from about this passage. This week, I saw something in this passage in a new way, and that's what I want to share with you today. So if any of those other things that, that we often speak about and discuss with this passage, you know, connected with you, I encourage you to, to look into that and explore some of those aspects of this passage, because they are really powerful. Today, I want to focus on, on this way that God saw, brought me to see this passage anew, to see this account and this ex experience anew. And so when, when I look at this passage, what I see is the disciples assessing the situation. They saw that it was getting late, that the people needed to eat, which is a reasonable assessment of the situation. They saw the numbers of people that needed to eat. And their solution was for Jesus to send the people away so that they could go get some dinner. And, and the question that came to me is, is that, that God revealed to me is why? Why was that? their solution to the assessment of the situation that they had made. 
Now, to be true, the, the disciples throughout the Gospels, we see that they wrestled with unbelief and, and lack of understanding. Um, and, and as I mentioned, their lack of faith is often the point of discussion in this passage of, you know, why they, they saw, you know, from a limited human perspective what they had and, and decided that, well, how can we feed these many people with only five loaves of fish and, and two or five loaves of bread and two fish. But I want to lean into that with a little bit more curiosity of, of why they thought the solution to this need of the people was for Jesus to send them away to go to the villages and get some food. Because the thing is, so far in, in the Gospel of Matthew, we've already witnessed Jesus healing sickness and disease. We've witnessed him cleansing people of leprosy and saying that, yes, I am willing to do so. We see him healing a servant of a centurion that came to him without even going back to the centurion's home to touch and heal that servant. We see him healing Peter's mother-in-law, one of the disciples. We see him healing demon-possessed individuals that he encounters in his travels. We see him calming the storms that, that were raging around in the sea when the disciples and him were on a boat. We see him casting demons out of men into pigs. We see him healing a paralyzed man that was brought to him by his friends. We see him healing a woman just by her touching the hem of his cloak. We see him healing the daughter of a synagogue leader. We see him healing blind men who cry out from the side of the road, son of David, have mercy on us. We see him casting demons out of a man who had been made mute, and, and this man can talk again. And we we even see him send out his 12 disciples with authority to heal and to cast out demons and to cleanse sickness in his name. And in many of these situations, people didn't just wait for Jesus to come find them living, living their lives. And, um, you know, then Jesus identifies this need and addresses their need. They brought their needs proactively to him. And we read of this in these accounts, and you can go back and read of these accounts of, of Jesus's works that are witnessed to you in the scriptures. And so we see that people came to them, to came to him with their needs. And the disciples had already seen his great miraculous power. They themselves brought their needs to him in, in that situation that I spoke of where they were on a boat and they were crossing the sea and, and a storm came up and, and was shaking the boat and, and they were scared and they said, Lord, help us, we're going to die. They brought this need to him with some expectation that he was going to be able to speak to their need, that he was going to be able to do something. Now, they were amazed at what Jesus actually did, because what he did was commanded the sea and, and made it calm down. And so maybe they didn't expect, to them, expect him to answer their need in quite that way, but they came to him with their need. They expected him to do something in their time of desperation and need. And so... I wonder with these experiences that the disciples have already had with Jesus, why, when they assess that the people would see me to eat their dinner, why was their solution to send the people away so that they could get fed on their own, so that they go, could go into the villages and buy their own food? And I wonder if it was partly because they didn't think that dinner was something that Jesus was concerned with. Rabbis at that time were not usually responsible for feeding their disciples, and actually disciples often paid their rabbis for their teachings and hosted them in their own homes for meals as, as a means of, of appreciation and, and, and payment, so to speak, for their teaching, for their sharing of wisdom as rabbis. And so I wonder if, if the disciples felt like feeding the people wasn't really Jesus' job. What they had to eat for dinner that night didn't concern him as a great teacher and miracle worker. Maybe it was too basic of a need. Because when it came to healing diseases and sickness and commanding storms and casting out demons and giving authority to do the same, they needed Jesus. They couldn't do those things on their own. They saw clearly their need for him in those moments. 
and maybe buying dinner was something that that they felt like the people could actually do for themselves. <laughs> maybe they didn't really need him in order to feed themselves to to go find dinner. And and so I wonder if in this moment, one of the things Jesus was doing was redefining who he is. He wasn't an ordinary rabbi. He wasn't a typical teacher just there to pass on wisdom and teaching and beliefs and rules or laws. He wasn't just this political messiah that Israel was expecting that would restore Israel to its power in the lands. He wasn't just a miracle worker that showed up on the scene when a miracle was needed or a fairy godmother type that, that would just come and do some miraculous healing or sign or, or a wondrous thing and then move on. No, he wasn't just those things. He is the bread of life, the giver of life. He is compassionate. He wants to share in life with his people and he is concerned with all aspects of his people's lives. Not just the grandiose, miraculous moments and healings, but the mundane, ordinary things, like what are we going to have for dinner tonight? And I wonder if in this moment as well, Jesus was redefining what it meant to follow him and the community that he was building around himself. I wonder if he wanted his disciples to be more than teacher or to be more than disciples and followers of an ordinary teacher or rabbi. If he wanted them to participate with him and who he is and not just what he was doing for the people. If he was teaching them the nature of his ways and their own calling as his followers that his concern for his people reaches far beyond their expectations. I wonder whether he wanted his disciples to share life with him and to share life with others. And, and if he wanted them to participate with him in all things, not just the casting out of demons and the healing of the sick and, and walking on water, as, as we see in the next account that, that Peter does for just a moment with Jesus, if you want to if you want to read that account for, for yourself in the Gospels. I wonder if he wanted them to participate with him in all things, even the breaking of bread and the sharing of a meal with others. I wonder if he wanted all needs to be met in his presence, not just those grand and desperate ones, like being caught in a boat in the middle of a storm while at sea, or being plagued by, by um, demon possession or, or disease, but if he wanted even the simple needs of what's for dinner to be met in his presence. I wonder if he wanted them to know that as they participate with him, as followers, that he would provide for them. We see in this account that at the end, after they feed all of these people with their five loaves and their two fish, at the end, there's actually more than they started with. There's 12 basketfuls of food, one for each of them. That may be a coincidence, it, it may be not, but I wonder if Jesus was, was teaching them that as, as they follow him, what it means to follow him is to be abundantly provided for as they participate in what he's doing in every aspect of life, that he'll care for them in ways that they don't expect or don't understand. I wonder if he was building a community that shared in ordinary things with one another that came together for the breaking of bread, not just for miraculous healings that are good and important and tell us something about who God is and who he's revealing himself to be in Jesus, but if he's building a community that shares in the ordinary with one another. And if participating with Jesus in ordinary moments actually marks those moments with a different quality than when we try to live those ordinary moments on our own, one of the things that, that scholars tell us about this, this time and, and place where this account takes place is that um, there, was, there was inequitable access to food at this time. 
and, and in this land, that people, depending on their social status, had access to different amounts and qualities of food. And so while the disciples felt like, okay, these people can go out to the villages and buy their own food, they might not have been able to have access to quite the same amounts or quality of food. But we see that in the presence of Jesus, there was an abundance for everybody that all ate and were satisfied and there was even enough left over for each disciple to be cared for. And so maybe when we participate in what Jesus is doing in ordinary things, in ordinary moments, those moments are marked by something different than if we were to try to do it on our own. For the disciples to see how gathered fed in Jesus's presence was marked by a different quality than, the, than if they had gone out to the villages to buy their own food and to provide their own dinner. When we participate in what Jesus is doing in these ordinary moments, we get a taste of the kingdom in ordinary actions and, and, and moments of our lives. And I also wonder when I look at this account, if we're like the disciples, if we decide for ourselves what concerns Jesus and what doesn't. If we divide up our lives and say, well, Jesus is concerned with these things, but not with this. This is sacred, but this is secular. I need Jesus for this, but this I can do on my own. And, and my question for us is, what if there is no part of our lives that Jesus doesn't want to be part of? What if that is part of what he's teaching us in the feeding of the 5,000? What if he wants us to live every mundane moment of our lives in his presence? And if he wants us to participate in what he's doing in every aspect of our lives? And what would happen if we allowed him to be more than an ordinary rabbi or a miracle work in our lives? But if we allowed him to be the bread of life, our elder brother who cares about us, our savior who saved more than just parts of us, and our king who has claim over every aspect of our lives, who is Lord over everything, in our lives and every part of our being? What if participation with him in the ordinary moments and the things that we thought that we could do on our own brought about a taste of the kingdom, brought about an abundance beyond our own imagination? Maybe he wants to make the ordinary things of our lives extraordinary in his presence. In the season of, of um, the, the worship calendar that we're in right now is actually called Ordinary Time, and it's, it's a funny name for, for this season of, of Christian worship, corporate Christian worship, and, and it's a season of, of Jesus building his church, of discipleship, of the day-to-day -day building and transformation of God's people in his presence. He's shaping during the season what ordinary looks like for his followers and for his church. And so my question for us in this season of, of ordinary time, so to say, in, in the Christian calendar, is what areas of our lives have we deemed too ordinary to submit to discipleship? What areas of our lives have we deemed too ordinary to do in Jesus's presence? What areas of our lives are we doing out of our own power? Have we deemed something that Jesus has no concern with rather than participating in what Jesus is doing, what he wants to do in every aspect of our lives? What opportunities for the miraculous are we missing because we decided that something was outside of Jesus' concern? If the disciples had been adamant about no Jesus, feeding the people is not your job. This does not concern you. They would have missed out on an experience and an encounter with who God is 
in the miraculous feeding of, of the 5,000, um, 5,000 plus, there was 5,000 men, <laughs> but they would have missed out on the miraculous encounter with God that revealed something about who he is. If they had been adamant about, no, this, this aspect of our lives and these people's lives has nothing to do with you. What would happen when we, if we allowed him to be concerned with all aspects of our lives? Would we allow him to make even the ordinary moments extraordinary in his presence? Because I think that we've come to have this conception that Jesus is only concerned with the Sunday worship service or our Bible studies or our times of prayer or the spiritual disciplines that we're engaging. And yes, those things are good. And yes, Jesus is present in them. And he wants us to participate in what he's doing in those moments. He wants us to participate in ministry and mission in his church. But what if Jesus also was concerned with what job you take, how you move through your community, what you eat for dinner, the decisions that you make with your money. What is it for you that you've decided Jesus is not concerned with and you've decided that you can do it on your own? Because what we see in the life of Jesus is that he became flesh and assumed all of humanity, all of our humanity, not just parts of it. And becoming flesh and walking our earth, he, he made a bold statement that he cares about us holistically. He cares about all of us. And in his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, he redeemed all of our humanity. The fact that he rose again in a glorified human form and lives to this day in this moment as one of us is a declaration that he cares about our whole lives in totality. He has redeemed our whole humanity in totality. There is not a thing about your life that he is not concerned about. There is not a thing about your life that doesn't belong to him. There is not a thing about your life that Jesus isn't inviting you to participate in what he's doing. There is not a thing about your life that you are meant to do without him. Our whole lives are sacred because of who Jesus is. Our whole lives are sacred because Jesus became one of us. And because he assumed and redeemed our humanity and lives in this moment as one of us, everything belongs to him. Everything concerns him about our lives. And so my challenge to us today is just because we think we can do it on our own or can do it on our own in some shape or form, doesn't mean that we should. When we think we know what's best for ourselves or what is within our capability and power to do, when we think we know what we need, I assure us that Jesus has more for us than that more than we could ever imagine. Just as the disciples thought they understood that the people had it within their own power or means or capacity to feed themselves for dinner, Jesus showed that he could do abundantly more than that, abundantly more than what they expected, that he wanted to be involved in every aspect of their lives. And I believe that this has impact for our own lives and our walk with Jesus. As I said, there's nothing about our lives that, that he's not concerned with that he doesn't want to be involved with, that he's not already doing something in, that he wants us to participate in. And, you know, just an example of how in, in, in the most ordinary ways this can transform things, you know, something as simple as, you know, watching television, we think might be something that's so unsacred that God has nothing to do with it, that Jesus isn't present in that. But I'll tell you, you know, recently, even in the media that I'm consuming, I've, I've tried to say, you know, God, well, what are you doing in these moments to be aware of his presence when I'm doing something as simple as, as watching television? And, and for me, it's done two things. One, it's, it has shaped the media that I consume, right? Because when I recognize that God is concerned with that area of my life, that it is an area of my life to be disciples, that he is doing something in my life in terms of the media that I consume, 
then then he gets to have a say right he gets to shape what i consume in a way that that is glorifying to him the other thing that it has done is that it has allowed me to see him and to encounter and experience him and to learn about him in in the most unexpected moments i'll just be watching avatar you know, my thinking I'm minding my own business, but wanting to, to be open to Jesus's presence with me in all moments as I watch TV and just bam, right? Something happens in the television show that that reminds me of God's character or reveals to me something about who he is in a way that I hadn't seen it before or convicts me of, of something. And I'm just like, wow. <clears throat> God can make even an ordinary moment of watching an awesome show like Avatar into an extraordinary and holy and sacred moment because of who he is, because he's present in my life when I'm just chilling out and, and watching TV. And so I think that it has an impact in, in our personal journeys and, and experiences with God. I believe it also has an impact in the communities that we shape and participate in and the ways that we allow him to shape us as a church community. Just this week, as you guys may know, we had virtual GC Ignite for young adults. And one of the, the key pieces of, of the virtual GC Ignite experience for the young adults was times of games and fellowship. Now, there, there could be from a certain perspective uh, uh, a thinking that, well, what does games and fellowship have to do with the church event? What does games and fellowship have to do with the discipling of young adults in Jesus's church, of the building up of, of this generation of his followers? But I would say it has everything to do with it because God is present in our fellowship. God is building a community that shares ordinary moments with one another, like games and fun and laughter. He's building a community that breaks bread with one another, and he shows up extraordinarily in those moments. And I'll tell you, in our game nights during this past week, there were these, these incredible moments where God was giving us a taste of his kingdom of the joy of being in fellowship with one another, of being part of his body, of being united across the world. There are people who participated in virtual GC Ignite all across the world. And so we had this taste of his kingdom, of every tribe and every tongue coming together to glorify him in unity one with another. And so I, I would say that, that this this belief, this perspective that Jesus has concern with all aspects of our lives also impacts the way that we engage in church community, the kind of community we build, the fellowship that we build, and the ways that we move through the world as well. And so in this season of ordinary time, my prayer is that we would submit all areas of our, of our lives to Jesus, that we would allow him to disciple every area of our life, that we would be bold enough to ask the Spirit to reveal to us what areas we've decided Jesus isn't concerned with, that we can do on our own, and that we would allow him to dismantle these boxes and divisions that we have of sacred and secular, of Jesus's domain and my domain, and that in all areas of our lives, we would participate in what Jesus is doing that in our lives and in our church and in our communities, we would live out the ordinary in Jesus's presence and allow him to make it extraordinary, that we would share our ordinary with him and with others and believe that there is no part and, and of our lives that he doesn't want to be part of and that there would be no part of our lives that we would keep from him. Because there is nothing too ordinary for Jesus. In his presence and in our partic participation with him, he makes our ordinary extraordinary. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are concerned with every aspect of our lives. We thank you that in your humanity, you have taken up and made a declaration that, that all humanity, all aspects of our humanity and lives are, are something that you want to be part of. 
And God, we confess to you that we are prone to <laughs> dividing up our lives and saying, well, this belongs to Jesus and this belongs to me. This Jesus can disciple. This Jesus has lordship over, but this is an area of my life that he has no concern with. And God, as we confess this, we ask you to strengthen and embolden us by spirit to offer up all aspects of our lives to you, to live out the ordinary moments with you and allow them to be made extraordinary in your presence. We thank you, Jesus, that you are faithful to do this. And we thank you that you are a God that's not just a regular teacher or miracle worker, but that you're a God that wants to share your whole life with us, that you want us to share our whole lives with you, God. Holy Spirit, make us bold to, to say yes to this invitation. We thank you and we praise you that you are a God that is concerned even with what we have for dinner and how we have dinner. We thank you, Jesus, and praise you in your holy and your precious name. Amen. <laughs>